Chapter 15 Two Down Who's Next? It took me a moment to load up the maps and then get a location for us. Are you there? I asked the computer, and David didn't answer. I guess he remembered the people on the other end. Are you there? I repeated, but silence was the only thing I got. I stared at the map. The cabins had taken us through the ridge and down into a box-walled canyon. A stream cut its way through the centre of this one, and short scrubby bushes were scattered either side. The few trees that grew around us were tall, with thick trunks all out of proportion to their height. I frowned, looking up at the canyon walls and noting the strange horizontal mark about halfway up. David looked too. That's a watermark, he said. It really floods in here. I glanced at the sky. It was clear, but coming on to evening. Let's get moving, I said, changing the subject, even though the idea of flooding really bothered me. Instead of heading deeper into the canyon and hoping for a way out, we turned and headed out the other way. The walls slowly went from being sheer cliffs to a steep, rocky slope. I remembered hiking out near Alice Springs, my dad kicking over a rock and a spider the size of a bread and butter plate leaping out onto the path. It wasn't hard to stick to the stream bank until the sides of the canyon reduced to a gentler, less rocky slope. I pulled out the tablet and dragged up the map. We were more than a little off course. We need to set up camp for the night, I said, and David came and looked over my shoulder. We're kind of equidistant between Blossom and Su Lin, he said, pointing to the two camps, and I knew what he was going to say before it came out of his mouth. Don't, I said it at the same time as he spoke. We could split up. Dave looked at me, and I looked back. It'll be safer if we go together, and Blossom is furthest from everyone else. But I could bring Su Lin back and save us the trip. To be honest, it was an idea, but I had the voice in my head, and as far as I knew, he did not. Besides, the idea was flawed. We'd still have to go past her space. He bent down and took another look at the map. I waited while he judged the distances, letting him make up his own mind. He didn't sound too happy when he replied, You're right. I might need help to convince Blossom to come, I said, trying to make him understand he wouldn't be wasting his time, that I needed him. You knew her, I didn't. He shrugged and started walking in the direction of Blossom's camp. We wouldn't make it by nightfall, but we'd come close. I was nearly right. We were both running on night vision by the time her pod came into sight, and we were both nearly blinded by the flash as it went up in flames. David shouted something rude and ran toward the fire. I was too numb to speak. Seeing him break into a run, I ran after him, but I wasn't trying to reach the pod. As soon as I was close enough, I dived at him, knocking him off his feet and landing on top of him. He was swearing, saying the same word over and over again. I kept him pinned and raised my head to look around. That evenatch flying thing didn't make much noise, and if it was cloaked, I hadn't a ghost of a chance of seeing it before it saw us. But I tried anyway. Well, 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 I thought. Reflections. I watched as the alien craft slid past on the other side of the burning wreck, fire mirrored along its flanks. Get your head down. The whisper from a nearby clump of bushes caught me by surprise, and I turned to look. Down, I said, and a rock whizzed over my head. I ducked, lying flat across Dave's body. This would have been embarrassing if I hadn't been trying to save him. Heck, it was embarrassing anyway. I heard a change in the whistling engine note and remembered to keep my head down. It was hard not to look. David didn't move a muscle and the voice didn't speak again until the craft had whipped away into the night. Even after I was sure it was gone, I stayed still. It was only when Dave shifted uncomfortably beneath me that I moved. I slid off his back and onto the ground beside him. You okay? I said, and the expression he turned to me said it all. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. He nodded and I decided to ignore the moisture gleaming on his cheeks. I was trying to think of what to say next when the shadows moved and a girl crawled out from the bushes from which I'd heard the voice. Who in the world are you? she asked. Yep, same voice. I remembered what David said about Blossom not being as sweet and nice as everyone thought she was. Blossom? I asked. What's it to you? Hey, cool down, Bloss. This is Laurie Canavis. She's supposed to be rescuing us. I watched Blossom glance toward her burning pod. Yeah, well, she's doing a great job. Thanks, I said, then gestured toward the flaming wreck. How come you weren't inside? 
She came over and sat down beside us. In the firelight, I could see I'd remembered correctly. She did have brown curly hair and coffee-coloured skin. I could also see why David said she wasn't what everyone thought. Her next words proved it. That voice in the computer, it's a real person. He told me to get out and wait till he said to come back. I'm going to wreck those sons of... She hesitated, changed tack. Want to help me totes ruin their day? Yeah, I do, I said. But first we've got to get everyone together. We weren't meant to find each other, Blossom said. Were we? Not this soon, I told her. But there was a mission to get our communicators to talk, remember? Yeah, how long was it supposed to take? About six months or so. Those dirty lizard-faced shiitakes, Blossom exclaimed. I am so going to find whoever is in my computer and wreck his day too. It's not fair what they did. They pretend to kill us and then we wake up. How is that even funny? I hear you, I said. And they're next on my list, just as soon as I can get the rest of us together. You? And now she's glaring at me, looking like I'm spouting garbage I can't deliver on. And who died and made you queen? Now I began to get what Dave meant when he said she wasn't all sweetness and light. The girl had an attitude with a capital A, and it wasn't a nice one either. In fact, it might be even worse than mine. Except I was the boss. No way was anyone going to have an attitude worse than mine. Not if I wanted to get them to do what they had to do in order for all of us to survive. They did, I said, snapping it out and hard and fast like a slap in the face. And seeing as they know who the heritage are and they've got the tech to help us survive, I'll go along with it, for now. I glanced at the flames. I was told to find you and get you to safety, and that's what I'm doing. She stared at me, and I saw her tamp down the anger inside. Fine, she said. You do that. But who says the rest of us have to go along? I glared at her, then remembered a line from a really old movie. It made me smile. You'll come with me if you want to live, I said. And Dave cracked up. I hadn't known he'd watched the same movies I had. Well, at least some of the same movies I'd watched. It looked like Blossom had watched it too, because she smiled and settled herself cross-legged beside us. Fine, she muttered, and I could tell that smile ran deep. So, Dave said, is this where we're going to spend the night? I thought about it, half expecting Blossom to answer for me, but it seemed like she'd made up her mind to let me keep my position as leader. I was almost disappointed. This was a big job and I was pretty sure I didn't want it. I still couldn't work out why the lizards had chosen me. I mean, with her attitude, wouldn't Blossom have been a better pick? I thought about it for all of a second and then decided she was probably the second best pick. I'd been the only one to scream at one full in the face on their own ship. Even Bloss hadn't pulled that one out of her hat. But then there was Mitch. Why not make him leader? Heck, I was so full of it. Blossom probably was a better choice. I sighed and Blossom turned to me. I know what you're thinking, she said, and I looked over at her. Yeah? I raised my eyebrows. Yeah, you're wondering why the leaders made you queen, and why on earth I'm going along with it. Well, that's pretty direct. So, I said, pushing her just to see what she'd do. So what? So why are you going along with it? She returned my question with a wide-eyed look. You can't be serious, she finally said. Yep. So you don't know you're the biggest troublemaker on the block? You have got to be kidding me, I exclaimed, and David started laughing. Blossom turned to him, and she doesn't even know it. Nope. David was laughing so hard he was almost crying. I glared at him, then realised he was probably still reacting to the attack. I mean, it was exactly like the attack they'd launched on his pod, and he'd barely made it out alive. I glared at them both, then looked around, thinking of David's earlier question. Yes, I said. We'll spend the night here. I don't think they're coming back, and it's warm. Blossom looked at the pod's wreckage. You can say that again. I resisted the urge, and Blossom asked the next question I expected. So who are the heritage? Well, as far as I can tell, they're a bunch of redneck lizards who think they should rule the universe and that anyone who's not a lizard doesn't deserve to live. You mean like the Ku Klux Klan? 
yeah, or the Caliphate of the Redeemed, or those dudes who believe they've inherited the key to knowledge because their ancestors were from the oldest civilization in the world. Any of them, all of them, you can take your pick. I couldn't help it. I'd raise my voice. Those people made me so mad. And to find out they existed even in alien societies was really disappointing. I mean, if this was what an advanced civilization was like, what hope was there for humans to get over themselves and their stupid hang-ups? Sickos, Blossom muttered, but David was staring at me. You've really thought about this, haven't you? He asked. I shook my head. Nope. I've tried really hard not to think about this, and here it is, just smacking me in the face. I am so pit annoyed right now. David didn't seem to have anything to say to that, but he rummaged in his pack, pulling out three ration bars, which he divided between us. We've still got to eat, right? I nodded, but I was worried. There was no sound coming from my visor, no intruding voice in my ears making snarky commentary on the conversation. I had never known my computer-based companion to be so quiet before. Of course, I'd only known he'd existed for a day, so maybe I didn't know everything, 